Knowledge is power, at least at what we hear. Have you ever thought that what you know could limit your life or lead to the limitless life that you've always wanted? Have you ever wondered where you learned certain things and why you settled them to live them as your truth? We think that it may be time to ask some questions about what we've been taught, especially about the Bible, in order for us to find the fullness of what God has for us. And today I have the opportunity and the honor to, to encourage you guys with a message today that's titled Striving and Starving. Striving and Starving. But before we hop into it, I wonder, can we pray together? And so Father, I thank you, God, for the opportunity that we have today, God, to worship you. God, it's not just today, but it's every day of our lives, God, that we choose to set aside, we say we honor you. And so, God, today, I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, God, that you would speak through me. God, that you would allow me to get out of the way. God, that it would be your words and not mine. God, that you would speak to your people in a, in a fresh and a new and a powerful way. God, that they would understand Jesus and the fullness and the grace that he has for them. God, we love you and we honor you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. 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 So, here we are. How many of you guys would agree with me that 2020 has been hard. Yeah? Can I get some help here? All right, just making sure. No one's had like an easy year? If it's been easy, man, I need some help because I would say, listen, 2020 has been tough. It's been a challenge. Like we find ourselves in this place where many of us have never walked through a year like this. And what was interesting is at the beginning of the year, we were kind of in this place where we enjoyed it for a moment. Am I right? Like, quarantine's not so bad. Like, I'm just going to hang out, watch TV, uh, maybe get some extra time with my wife and my kids. And then a couple months went by and like, man, I can't stand my wife and my kids. Like, I need some space, right? And then many of us were working from home, but we were doing less. We were doing less, yet we found ourselves more exhausted than we've ever been before. And so we went through this, this period of time for a few months. And then, I don't know about you guys, but I felt this pressure to play catch up. We had all this time where we were doing less. It's like, okay, well, now it's time to get to work. We got business to take care of. And so we started working more. We started working harder. We started striving. We started pushing in order to make things happen. And we found ourselves even more exhausted. And we're constantly in this place of striving and pushing and trying to make things happen. And we're tired. And I don't know about you guys, but when I work hard, and I get tired, I get hungry. Not just hungry, hangry. How many guys know about some hanger, okay? And here's the deal, you start working, you start pushing, and you're like, man, I am hungry. And here's the beauty is, we've been walking through John 4 as a church, and kind of taking a look at that, and this particular scripture has something to say about being hungry. And so we're going to hop just into that here in just a moment, but before we do, I want to ask you one question. And it's really the question that we're building this entire message around. As we've been pushing, and we've been striving, and we've been working, who taught you that you have to do more? Where did that come from? Why have you believed the lie that we have to do more? And so let's talk about that. We pick up in John 4 with a woman at the well. If you haven't been around um, for the last few weeks that we've been going through this series, I'd encourage you to go read through John 4 uh, and also go take a listen to those messages from Pastor Matt and Pastor Kerry as they've really been breaking down this portion of Scripture. All right, so here's the deal. I'm going to give you the, uh, the 30-second NLT. That's the Nathan Lewis translation. All right, and here's what it is. I just gave away my middle name. I'm sorry, everybody. All right, Jesus finds this woman at the well. And he ends up kind of revealing himself to her. She doesn't quite buy it. She doesn't kind of see the Messiah is right in front of her face. But ultimately, he reveals that to her. And then as a result, she's like, dude, this is amazing. And so she goes to tell the entire village. All right? And that's where we pick up is she has gone and told the entire village. The disciples were in town. They're starting to wake their, wake their, or excuse me, work their way back. And then Jesus, he's just hanging out at the well. All right? We all on the same page? All right, so if you have your Bibles, open up to John 4, or if you have the YouVersion Bible app, you can find it there, um, or you can also find that in the Mercy City app. While you guys are getting your phones out, because I guess we'll allow phones here at church, you guys can check in on social media, and every time you guys do that, we make a donation on your behalf um, to our partners in both Bulgaria and here locally, uh, and so we want to encourage you to do that. You guys ready? 
All right, here we go. I need you guys' help. Remember, right when I started, we agreed we're going to have fun at church. Cool? So we're on the same page. Let's have some fun. All right, John 4, verse 31 says, Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. Here's the deal. They're like, listen, man, we haven't eaten all day. And if, you, if we haven't eaten all day, then you certainly haven't had a chance to eat. All right? And then Jesus pulls a little trick on him because that's what Jesus does. Verse 32, Jesus replied, I have a food, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. Well, wait a second. Where did you get this food? Like, I don't know about you guys. I read this scripture, and I'm wondering if, like, Jesus has a hot dog in his pocket. Like, <laughs> where did you get this food? And he kind of answers us in verse 33. And the disciples are having that same question that I'm asking. They said, did someone bring him food while we were gone? The disciples asked each other. And I don't know about you guys, but some of your Bibles, you know, it has, like, the footnotes and stuff on there. And some of them have, like, you know, part B of a verse, almost like it only shows up in some translations. When I look at verse 33, I'm wondering if this is the invention of Jimmy John's. <laughs> did someone bring him food while we were gone? The disciples asked each other, because if so, that was freaky fast. Like, <laughs> and so I'm wondering, like, is this Jimmy John's? The Lord provides. <laughs> but verse 34, Jesus goes on and says, Then Jesus explained, My nourishment comes from doing the will of God, who sent me, and from finishing his work. That is where Jesus finds his nourishment. That's where Jesus finds his fulfillment. And so as we ask ourselves this question of, Who taught you that you have to do more? I want to tell you right now that it's not about doing more. It's about doing more of the right things. It's about coming in alignment with the Father's will for our lives. And so I want to kind of show you guys this and break it down a little bit more. Because here's the deal. As many of us, we are pushing to do whatever it takes to make it happen. And it's kind of mentioned in the title, we are striving. The definition of strive is to exert oneself vigorously or to try hard. That's what it means to strive. And many of us, we're in this place where we're constantly striving. And my question for you today is, what are you striving for? Are you striving for love? Are you trying to get the affection of a parent or maybe even a spouse that for some reason you never received? And so now you're working trying to earn that and you've fallen into this place where if I just work hard, if I just push, if I just make it happen, maybe someone will love me. Maybe someone will appreciate me. But Jesus doesn't come to us with that message. And so we find ourselves striving. And can I be honest? It's like a treadmill. Can we all admit that treadmills are dumb? Are we all on the same page? Come on, church. Treadmills are dumb. Because here's the deal. is you get on that treadmill, and, man, you step up the incline, you step up the speed, and you're going for it, and ultimately you're exerting all of this energy, and you are going nowhere. Absolutely nowhere. And you just find yourself exhausted. And here's the deal. As many of us, we convince ourselves that there's an opportunity in our lives that never came from God in the first place. And so what do we do? It's like hopping over to the next treadmill. We push and we go all out for this opportunity and we find ourselves exhausted. And rather than recovering and striding the way that God wants us to, we step over to the next treadmill and we exhaust ourselves again. And we repeat this cycle over and over and over again. And I'm telling you guys that it is exhausting. And many of us, we find ourselves in this place where we're striving and as a result, we're leading on empty. We have nothing left in the tank but we know that there's got to be more. There has got to be more to this life, and I'm working so hard, and I just don't see it. And I'm telling you right now, that will not change until you learn to move at the pace of grace. Because there is a pace of grace, and that's what I want to break down a little bit for you guys, and as we kind of lean into this idea. And so what I want to talk to you guys about is three keys to staying full. And the first one is this. Choose to stride, with a D, not to strive. Choose to stride, not to strive. Well, what does it mean to stride? That's kind of a weird word. None of us really use that all that much, right? Here's what stride means. It means to walk with long, decisive steps in a specific direction. Let's take a look at that again. All right, you ready? Stride means to walk. Everybody say walk. With long, decisive steps in a specific, say specific, direction. It's a pace that we can maintain, and it's a specific pace because we're called for a very specific purpose. We've got to stop falling into this life where we're striving and running in every single direction. We've got to start coming in stride with our Heavenly Father. But here's the deal. Quite honestly, what does this look like? I'll be the first one to tell you I don't know. I have no idea. 
should I just go ahead and walk off the, the stage now? Like, I'm not your guy. I don't, I don't have the answer to what this looks like. If you guys knew me, my entire life before kind of stepping into full-time ministry was in the, as an entrepreneur. And I'm going to work hard. And I'm going to make it happen. And it took years of shaking that off of me until I could finally learn to walk. Notice I said to walk in the fulfillment that God has for me. And so here's the deal. If I'm going through life, and this is real practical if you're doing anything, and you don't know what to do, just look to the Bible. Like if you don't know what to do, take it to the Bible and submit to that. All right? And so here's the deal. I opened up my Bible. I started looking for examples of people that walk. I don't know if you guys know this. The Bible was written a few years ago. There's a lot of people that walked. There's this one guy in particular. His name is Jesus. And so in the wise words of the modern prophet Kanye West, Jesus walks. Okay? And so I'm going to show you real practically what that looks like in this portion of Scripture because we have to understand that Jesus fulfilled the entire Old Testament, all the messianic prophecies, in three years. He accomplished his ministry from the time that he was 30 to he was 33 before he ultimately went to the cross. Yet you never hear an example of Jesus rushing to his next appointment, cutting an exchange short because he had more important things to get to. He walked with long, decisive steps in a specific direction, ultimately to the cross. And so here we are. We're going to take a look at, take a look at Luke 8. All right, so we're going to pick up in verse 40. So on the other side of the lake, the crowds welcomed Jesus because they had been waiting for him. Then a man named Jairus, a leader of the local synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come home with him. His only daughter, who was about 12 years old, was dying. So Jairus comes to this place of desperation, and he goes to Jesus, and he says, listen, man, I need your help. I'm in the midst of needing a miracle, and something has got to change. And so he goes to Jesus asking for this miracle. And then we continue to pick up, uh, it says, in this, that uh, he was surrounded by the crowd. So his only daughter, who was about 12 years old, was dying. And Jesus went with him. He was surrounded by the crowds. How many of you guys know that if you are surrounded by a crowd, you're probably walking? If you're running out ahead of those people, they can't keep up. I can't find it in any commentary where it says that the crowd was a bunch of marathon runners. Maybe that would make sense. But in order for the crowd to press up against him, Jesus was moving at a specific stride. And so he noticed that he didn't let someone interrupt his stride. He didn't speed up to get to Jairus. He didn't slow down because of the woman. He stayed with his stride. How many of us are running forward in a place where the people around us can't even get a chance to interact with us? Because we're running a million miles an hour forward, but we miss the opportunity for miracles. Verse 43 says, A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding, and she could find no cure. And then coming up behind Jesus, she touched the fringe of his robe, and immediately the bleeding stopped. Verse 45, Who touched me? Jesus asked. And everyone denied it, and Peter said, Master, this whole crowd is pressing up against you. Like, bro, we're in a crowd Everyone is touching you. Like, what do you like? If I'm Jairus, I'm freaking out because the scripture tells us that Jesus stopped for a moment. And I'm like, dude, we have more important things to get to. My daughter is dying. And many of us, we find ourselves in that exact same place where we're telling God, I got more important things for you to do. And we're trying to put God on our timetable when the fact of the matter is, we have to surrender our timetable to God. It was never about Him coming into alignment with our schedule, it was about us aligning our schedule with His will for our lives. And so when the woman realized that she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble and fell to her knees in front of him. The whole crowd heard her explain why she had touched him and that she had been immediately healed. Daughter, he said, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. This is the pace of grace. This is what it looks like. Look at the divine timing of this. If you look at this portion of scripture, you see two things, all right? That the woman had suffered with the issue of blood for 12 years, and that the little girl that was dying was also 12 years old. If Jesus had changed his pace of grace, if he had ran outside of the Father's will for his life, he would have missed the opportunity to perform two miracles at once. When you are running in life, you miss the miracles that are happening in your midst. 
When you're constantly running forward, distracted by the things of the world, you're missing opportunities because you're not staying with the pace of grace. And when you run ahead of the pace of grace, you miss those miracles, and then when you have that pace, you have to sustain it on your own. And I can tell you guys from experience, it's exhausting. Because many of us, we receive what we think is a word from God, and rather than submitting that to accountability through the church or maybe lining it up with the scriptures, we think it's a good idea and we run with it. And we run out ahead of God. And we have to sustain that on our own. And if you're in that place, I'm telling you there's freedom from it. You don't have to be exhausted anymore. Verse 49, while he was still speaking to her, a messenger arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. He told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But when Jesus heard what happened, he said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just have faith and she will be healed. And when they arrived at the house, Jesus wouldn't let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, James, and the little girl's father and mother. The house was filled with people weeping and wailing, but he said, stop the weeping, she isn't dead, she's only asleep. But the crowd laughed at him because they all knew she had died. Verse 54, then Jesus took her by the hand and said in a loud voice, my child, get up. And at that moment, her life returned, and she immediately stood up. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a cause for celebration. But the people that are in the midst of the miracle, they refuse to celebrate. They're only weeping and willing because they don't believe that Jesus truly has the power. And many of us, were walking through a circumstance where we, like, we believe conceptually that Jesus has the power. But we're not willing to submit that and to actually forward in that place of surrender. Does that make sense? And so many of us, we have lost the art of celebration. We don't even know what it looks like to celebrate anymore. 2020 has zapped us to the point where we have nothing to give forward, where we can celebrate the goodness of God even when he's performing miracles in our midst. We miss it. And so we have to reclaim the art of celebration. Here at Mercy City, one of our core values is celebration. And we believe that you attract what you celebrate. And so we need to be those people that celebrate. And alongside that, verse, or point number two is choose delight, not duty. At what point did that very thing you prayed for become a burden? Last year, what you saw as an opportunity, now this year you see as an obligation. So you're praising for God something last year, and now you are convinced that it's a curse. Since when were we led by our emotions? Because I'm telling you right now that your emotions will lie to you. And so we look at this with Jesus, right? And if I'm saying, hey, listen, I don't know what this looks like, but ultimately I'm going to learn from Jesus. Jesus, the author, the perfecter, and the finisher of our faith, took joy in performing the will of his Father at all times. Somebody say, at all times. Here's what that looks like. Think about Jesus' ministry. I think about the early stages, right, him performing miracles. That sounds kind of fun, right? Can we be real? Like, I would take joy in that. I think about Jesus healing the blind man, and it's like a party trick where he spits in the dirt and rubs mud on his eyes, and everyone's like, dude, that was a little weird. Uh, like, you could have done it a different way. But I think Jesus probably had a little bit of fun in that, right? And so he found joy in performing the will of his Father by performing these miracles and all these things that accomplished or were accompanied his early ministry. But how many of you guys know that he also found joy in going to the cross? The Bible says that because of the joy set before him, Jesus en endured the scorn and the punishment and the humiliation of the cross. Because of the joy set before him. You know what that joy was? It was you. You were the joy set before Jesus. And even though it hurt, even though he even submitted to his father, if it, you had be any other way, but ultimately, God, I will do your will. Even when it hurt, he found joy in it. And so I want to challenge you. Choose to finish even when it's not fun. Many of us, we're walking through this life. We're following Jesus. We're trying to do all the things that he's called us to. But we want to quit when it's not fun anymore. Serving's fun for a while. Parenting's fun for a while. But at some point, it becomes a little bit difficult. But we have to be those people that finish because God has called us to be those finishers. And check this out. If we go back to John 4, we see this really practically. Then Jesus explained, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God. So by starting and doing, he says, but who sent me? And from finishing his work. Jesus finds fulfillment 
in finishing what his father had called him to. And so we have to finish what we're called to. The third point is this. As we're going through this journey, as we're trying to stay full, because many of us, we're leading on empty, and we're trying to find fulfillment in the life that Jesus has for us, we have to choose dependence and not independence. Choose dependence and not independence. And I know I say that, and that is the most like counter-American thing that you could ever say. Like, this is the red, white, and blue, right? And, and we're just called to all these great things, and we're independent, we're a free country. And what happens is, when we start following Jesus, we drag some of those personality traits into our faith journey. We refuse to submit and be dependent. And so we want to convince ourselves that we can do this on our own, but eventually what happens is you end up completely pouring out and coming from a place where you can find no fulfillment and no fullness. As you guys can imagine, for me and my wife leading the dream team, where individuals serve, we have the conversation very frequently, to be honest, where people come to us and they will say, listen, I think it's time for a break, man. I think I need to take a step back because I've been in this place where I'm constantly pouring out and I just need to be poured into for a season. And I would challenge you, I know it's not fun to hear, that's not how this faith journey looks like with Jesus. We are constantly being poured into and fulfilled through our relationship with Jesus. It's not on our pastors, it's not on us as a leadership team, it comes only through a personal relationship with Jesus that we can learn to be in that place. Because what happens when we're constantly in this place where we're drained and we're exhausted is we're no longer operating from the overflow of what God's doing in us. We're operating from a place of show. Like we can't be those people that are just showing off and leaning on our own strength because something that I told first service, we have to understand with this pace of grace piece that there's two definitions of grace. Most of us wouldn't know that if we took a look at the Bible. The first one is the one that we're all familiar with, right? It's the unmerited, unearned favor of God. There's nothing you could ever do to get it. You receive it by placing your faith in Jesus Christ. The end, right? We're all familiar with that grace. There's another Greek translation of the word grace, and it means divine or supernatural empowerment. There are things you do in your life that come easy to you that someone else is challenging. And so take an assessment. What are those things in your life? Like, I could be really honest with you guys. Even in this moment, standing before you guys, I'm not nervous. I'm not worked up. This doesn't seem all that challenging. And it's not because I'm great. Trust me, I'm not impressive. It's because of the Spirit of God has placed a grace on my life for this. But each and every one of us, you have a unique grace and you have a unique gift. The Bible tells us that a measure of grace is poured on each and every one of us. And so here's a perfect example. Well, I can stand you before you today, and by no means does it mean I'm perfect. By, d by no means does it mean I'm great at this. But I could go to a place earlier this week where I had to make a phone call. And I was freaked out. Like, I mean, full-on freaked out. Like, anyone uh, make a phone call and you rehearse that phone call like five times before you make it? Yeah. Just me? Okay. It's 2020. You can text me. I don't want to talk on the phone. <laughs> All right? And so I was getting ready to make this phone call, and I'm like so nervous and I'm rehearsing it, and then I go to make the call, and then I'm like, nah, never mind. I'll do it later. Like, how many of you guys know when you don't want to do hard things, you just put it off? You're like, ah, I'll get to it later. I have something else that I could be doing right now. And so I kept putting off making this call. And then I remember I was actually here at work, and I walked upstairs to make this call, and my voice is like shaking. Heart rate's at like 180, and I'm freaking out, right? Because there's not a grace in my life for that. I'm not great at handling those conversations. Meanwhile, we have people like Marcelina on our team, but you'll see her like juggling three phones, like making all these calls, like telling people like, nope, you need to get it done. And like has no problem like being real honest and truthful with people, but being full of grace at the same time. And I watch her do what she does and I get filled with tremendous anxiety. Or I watch Chloe who's in her first service. She's our kids director. I watch what she does with the kids and I get tremendous anxiety. Like I got two kids. I can, I can barely manage those. Like how am I going to manage a couple of hundred? You know, like they're everywhere here at Mercy City. It's the truth. We're going to grow this church one way or another. <laughs> the Bible says be fruitful and multiply. You guys are doing great, Mercy City. <laughs> but there's a grace on my life for this, but not for that. And so where's the grace on your life? And so take inventory of those things, because when you're operating from a place of grace, and in that pace of grace, it's not draining. And you can operate completely from the overflow, and it's not for show. Does that make sense? Can I show you guys real practically what that looks like? 
Is that okay? So you guys have seen this the whole time, and you're probably like wondering, like, what is the deal with this? Right? And so I got my three cups here, pitcher of water. So are you guys nervous watching me do this? Yeah, me too. It only gets worse. You're going to see where this is going. And so here I am, right? I'm fooled up. Maybe I get uh, filled up with a word from God or whatever it is. And I start operating. So I receive that initial word, right? But then I start operating in my own strength. And so what I do is I start, okay, well, I got a team to encourage, so I'm going to encourage them, and I'm going to take care of my kids and then make sure to encourage my spouse. And all the while, I'm working, and I'm pouring out, pouring out, pouring out, and I can't fill up anyone, like literally no one. And so all the people around me, they're still not fulfilled, and I am completely empty. Like, I have completely poured out. Why? Because I'm operating in my own strength. But ultimately, when we are in relationship with our Father and we're doing the will of our Father, what we do is we operate out of the overflow. And so I'm in this place, and the Holy Spirit continues to fill me. And the people that I come into contact with, I start filling them up, but I'm never poured out. I always stay full, and whoever I come into contact with, they receive what I'm able to do as well. And so I am never drained when I'm close to my Father and I'm staying in alignment with his will. Does that make sense? And so here's the deal. We have to know that we're called to be in close proximity with our Father. Anytime we're starting to feel drained, we're starting to feel poured out, it means there's probably been a gap that's been created. And God's never the one that moved. It's us that have started to operate in our own strength, and we've been dependent only on ourselves, rather than leaning into the will of God for our lives. And this looks, so that's vertically, right? We also got to consider this horizontally. What are the relationships in your life? Who do you need to pull close so that they can experience what God is doing in your life. Many of you have family members that do not know Jesus. And you're like, you're doing it for show. You're studying the scriptures. You're trying to find every way you logically can prove God to them. And you're failing, and it's exhausting. Just me? Okay, thank you. You want to know how you lead those people to Jesus? You just pull them close. You let them see what Jesus is doing in your life. And they're going to start to experience the goodness of God. The Bible says the goodness of God that leads man to repentance. And so we're able to let other people experience what God is doing in our lives when we draw them close. And then also think above that, who are you drawing close to that can pour into and encourage you? But remember, like I talked about at the end of the day, it's not on any person to be responsible for filling your cup. Your friends will fail you. Your family will fail you. I will fail you. Jesus will never fail you. And so you have to stay in that place of relationship because where you find your food is where you find your fulfillment. Because here's the deal. Angelique, you want to come up here? They don't think I'm spiritual enough. Angelique's going to make me sound way better. You guys ready? (laughs) The Holy Spirit sauce. Some of us are in a place where we're scrapping. Man, we're working hard trying to make it happen, trying to push. And we're exhausted. And we're trying to make every business decision, every family decision, every parenting decision, every school decision, come on. And we never take it to God because we've convinced ourselves that we can do it on our own. And so we're scrapping and we're fighting we're convinced that there's never going to be enough. There'll never be enough love for me. There'll never be enough joy for me. But I'm telling you that there's always more than enough. Because we serve a God who will give us infinitely and eventually more than we could ever ask or imagine. And so we have to stay close to him. No more scrapping. Because when you're fighting for those scraps, you're fighting for table scraps. And Jesus has called you to more than that. He wants you to experience the fullness that he has for you. And so as you stand to your feet, I want to ask you this question. Are you hungry? And I know some of you would answer that question naturally. You're like, yeah, man, I am hungry. This message is getting a little long. I got brunch plans. Let's wrap this up. But let's go deeper than that. Are you hungry for more? 
Are you finding yourself where there's no fullness? There's no nourishment. And it's time to be able to come to our Heavenly Father and eat. Luke 8, 55. We talked about it briefly, but I want to show you the tail end of that, that verse. We saw how the little girl says, and in that moment, her life returned, and she immediately stood up, right? But then it continues on, then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. It's time for us to eat. And I don't know where you are right now in this room, but what are you trying to prove? You have nothing to prove. Many of us, we've fallen into this place where if we could just work harder, and we could just do more, if we just be a better person, then maybe we'd experience fullness. But Jesus doesn't call us to that life. Not at all. And so you may be in this room, and you would fall in one of two categories. And I want to pray for you, no matter what category you fall in. Here in this story, right, we see the little girl, and many believe that she was dead. And some of us may be feeling that way this moment. And the Bible even tells us that those that don't know Jesus are spiritually dead. Here's the deal. Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came to bring dead people to life. And so maybe you're in this room and you're here, like physically, you're here, but you know there's more and there's no fulfillment. I'm telling you right now that that fulfillment's only found in the person of Jesus who lived a perfect and sinless life who died on the cross to pay the price for your sin so that you wouldn't have to work and strive anymore, so that you could experience his goodness and be led to a transformed life. And so maybe that's you. Or maybe you're in the other camp. Jesus said that the little girl was only asleep. And many of us right now, we're sleeping. And it's time to reawaken our faith because we've been in this place where our faith is passive. We're not doing anything about it. We compartmentalize it. Our faith will be a part of our lives on Sunday. We'll have a holy hangover on Monday, and then it wears off, and we gotta start all over again. I wanna tell you right now, there's no need for you to strive anymore. There's no need for you to push. But it's time for you to wake up. It's time for you to be fulfilled and experience fullness, and that only comes through doing the will of God and having that relationship with His Son, Jesus. And so if you're in either one of those camps, together as a church, I wonder if you would lift your hands. If you would say, that's me. I am that person where I need to reawaken and I need to take a step forward. Because I'm in a place where I have been striving and starving. I'm working hard and I'm trying to accomplish more and I've accomplished less than I could ever imagine. And it's time for me to stride into fullness. I'm done pushing. I'm done working hard. But God, I'm stepping into the purpose that you have for me. It was only through a relationship with Jesus. And so, Father, with our hands raised, God, that we surrender to you. God, even in this moment, it's just a simple physical posture, God. We surrender our lives. We say, here I am. God, we're done striving. We're done pushing, God. We're done trying to make it happen. God, this checklist faith where we're working harder, God, we choose to say no to all of that. And, God, that we would stride into the fullness that we can have through a relationship with your son, Jesus. God, the only good and perfect man that ever walked this earth. And so we choose to place our faith in you today. God, to set aside everything else. God, to lean into your purpose for our lives and to surrender each and every ounce of our being to you. God, we love you and we honor you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.